This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. All right, um, only two more of these, uh, what you might call, more introductory lectures uh, with our calculations. And the first one, <clears throat> perhaps slightly more important than the others, is uh, corporate dividend policy. Um, because what we're talking about here is how much dividend a company should pay out. And it may seem well, fairly obvious, uh, but it isn't. You see, suppose a company has um, earnings, profits after interest and tax, of, uh, let's say, 5,000. A decision then has to be made by the directors as to how much of that to pay out as dividend. You know, the 5,000 available, they could obviously pay 5,000 out as dividend, although most companies don't. And the reason is uh, that, of course, if they do pay a, a dividend of uh, the full 5,000, um, then there's nothing left to be retained. And if they're not retaining money, then they've not got money to be able to invest and expand the company. And if they're not investing and expanding the company, there's no reason we should expect the earnings in the future to change. Uh, you know, if it's 5,000 this year, the earnings, then if they haven't done any uh, investing and expanding, um, presumably well, we're going to expect it'll stay at 5,000 next year. Okay, they can pay a dividend of 5,000 and so on. And so fine, they do that, and they're paying a nice high dividend. So I must try and write better. They're paying a nice high dividend, which may seem attractive, but there's going to be no growth. Or no expectation of growth. I know earnings might change for other reasons. Uh, there's going to be no expectation of growth. And if the company's not growing, there's no reason why the share price should grow either. Um, a constant share price, there'll be no capital growth. And so fine, by all means do that. And as I say, shareholders may be happy to get a nice big dividend, but there's no reason why that dividend should grow in the future, and there's no reason, therefore, why the share price should grow. And so what they might decide to do instead, earnings 5,000, they may decide to pay out a much lower dividend, perhaps they'll pay out a dividend of, let's say, 1,000, and retain the remaining 4,000. And of course, if you understood what I said a minute ago, if they are retaining money, um, they've got money to invest and expand the company. And therefore, you're going to expect higher earnings next year. Uh, how much higher obviously depends on how the money's invested. But maybe, ooh, maybe the earnings next year are going to go up as a result to 5,500. Um, and as a result, they can afford to pay a high dividend. You know, if they decide they're going to pay out dividends of 20% of earnings each year, so uh, this year, 20% of 5,000, they pay out 1,000. If the earnings go up to 5,500 and they carry on paying a dividend of 20%, they'll pay out 1,100. They'll be retaining uh, more, and they can afford to invest more. And perhaps the year after, as a result, the earnings go up even more. Maybe they go up to 6,000. Again, how much they go up by depends on how, they, uh, how well they invest that retention. But if the earnings do go up, as you, you would be, be expecting, if they carry on paying 20%, they'd pay out 1,200 dividend. They're retaining more and so on. And in fact, for different reasons in a later chapter, I'll actually put proper numbers to it. But you should be clear about the principle that's happening. What's happening here is you're getting a lower dividend, or shareholders are getting a lower dividend, but 
Because the company is retaining more, the earnings are growing. Uh, the dividend is therefore growing. And at the same time, since the company is earning more, the company will be worth more. There will be growth in the share price. The share price will go up as well as the company becomes uh, bigger, more profitable. There'll be capital growth. And so that's why the company has to make a decision. Shall we pay a high dividend and have little or no growth? Or shall we pay a low dividend? In which case there will be growth. Uh, the share price will increase as well. Now, according to Medigliani and Miller, the decision is actually irrelevant. We call it dividend irrelevance. Because Medigliani and Miller said that, well, in theory, shareholders don't care. They don't care whether they get a high dividend or a low without it's not growing or a low dividend that is growing. It doesn't make any difference to them. They say, okay, you know, in the second case, they're getting a much lower dividend. But if shareholders wanted uh, more money, they could get more money by selling some shares. They're only getting a dividend of a thousand. If they want another four thousand, sell some shares. No problem. And because the share price is growing, they can sell shares each year and, in a sense, be no worse off. So Medigliani and Miller say, in theory, it doesn't matter. Shareholders don't really care whether it's high dividend or high growth in the share price. Well, that's fine in theory, uh, but in practice, uh, that doesn't hold true for basically three reasons. So three, what you might call problems with the idea of dividend irrelevancy. Uh, and I've listed them on this on the next page. The first one is something called the signalling effect. And this really relates to what happens if a company changes its dividend policy. Because again, you see, Medigliani and Miller say that it's irrelevant. And so, all right, this year they might decide to pay a low dividend retain. Ooh, next year, let's pay a high dividend uh, and not retain. The year after, let's pay a low dividend and retain. Doesn't matter. Year by year, do whatever you want. But this signalling effect um, is that if a company suddenly decides, for example, to pay a low dividend, you know, perhaps this company in the past has always been paying a very high dividend. I've said enough about the effect of it. But uh, this year, let's switch. Let's pay a low dividend. Shareholders won't mind. It'll mean we can invest more and grow more. Well, fine in theory, but in practice... If a company suddenly pays a lower dividend, shareholders tend to assume that something's gone wrong. You know, obviously, that can on occasions be the case. You know, if a company um, does badly and makes little profit, they're forced to pay a little dividend. But here, it's not because the company's done badly. They've suddenly decided to pay a smaller dividend because they're going to expand. Shareholders shouldn't be worried. But shareholders tend to be upset. They've been used to getting a high dividend. All of a sudden it goes low. They assume that there are problems. And all right, I, I can remember occasions when this has actually happened in real life. With big companies suddenly deciding to start paying lower dividends. And they've, they've done a lot of sort of publicity, you know, written to shareholders and explained there isn't a problem, we're still doing well, we're paying a low dividend so that we can expand. But despite all the ways, all the ways they attempted to explain the situation to shareholders and to tell them they shouldn't be worried, shareholders were worried. 
Low dividend problem. Share price drops. Again, bigger problem. And so that's one problem there can be. Uh, a second problem, liquidity preference. What we're getting at here is okay, despite everything I've said, some companies have a policy of paying quite high dividends, and as a result, little growth. Other companies have a policy of paying low dividends, but as a result, higher growth. And when people are deciding where to invest the money, they're taking that into account. Uh, for instance, an old person like me perhaps isn't particularly worried about capital growth, you know, if I'm not going to live for that many years. Perhaps I'm more concerned about getting income. Somebody who's on a pension is more concerned with the income. They choose to invest in companies that are paying high dividends. On the other hand, young people like yourself, if you've got a job and you're earning money and you're young, perhaps you don't need the income particularly. And so you're quite happy to invest in shares that pay a low dividend because you're more interested in the capital growth, that the value of your shares will increase. Uh, similarly, institutions, I mentioned earlier, the major investors are institutions like pension funds. Pension funds, you know, maybe a pension fund maybe wants high income and deliberately invests in companies that are paying high dividends. Well, the point is, if one of the reasons for choosing a company is because it's paying high dividends or it's paying low dividends but growing, you're going to be rather upset if the company changes its policy. Again, if I'm living on a pension and therefore choose to invest in shares that pay high dividends, I'm going to be rather upset if the company says, oh, we've suddenly decided we're going to change our policy and pay low dividends. That's not why I chose to invest in them. And OK, it's all right them saying, well, if you want more money, sell some of your shares. Why should I? Why should I have all the hassle of selling shares just because the company decided to pay a low dividend when I chose to buy the shares in the first place because I thought I was going to get high dividends? Um, finally, the third reason uh, is taxation. You're not expected to know the tax rules in the exam. I'm not worried there. But the point is, uh, the tax treatment of dividends is different than the tax treatment of capital gains. So if a company is paying high dividends, you know, you're taxed on those dividends. On the other hand, if they're paying low dividends, clearly the tax on dividends will be lower, but there's capital growth and potentially there's tax on the capital gains. So that can play a part depending on the tax position uh, of the investors. So somewhat less important, again, you're not expected to know the tax rules for this exam, uh, but it is a factor. Uh, as a result, despite in theory it not making any difference, I hope I've explained why, particularly signaling and liquidity preference, uh, why a dividend policy does matter. And so what most companies do is they aim to have a constant dividend policy. And they usually actually write it in the notes to the accounts. Our policy is this. So, you know, this company, they try and keep a constant policy. You know, perhaps their policy is to always pay 20% of earnings as dividend. They'll tell shareholders that. They'll stick to it every year, pay 20%. And then if shareholders like that, they've chosen to invest in it, they're happy. All right, they may not always be able to achieve it. Obviously, if profits do fall. Uh, they have a problem maintaining the dividend policy. 
but they do generally state their aim and try and stick to it. Or alternatively, you know, our policy is to pay out 100% of uh, earnings as dividend. Fine. But to have a steady policy, uh, and therefore you haven't got this signalling problem of suddenly changing, paying a bigger percent or a lower percent, or of shareholders choosing to invest because of the policy and then it changing. So as I've written under practical policy, A, aim for a steady pattern of dividends, that's what I mean, to have a policy of always pay X percent uh, of the earnings. Uh, one other thing mentioned, <coughs> uh, it fits in with it, although it is slightly different, is the idea of script dividends. Now, uh, what this is, and it's very popular, as always, I'm talking about large quoted companies, is when it comes time for the dividend, announce what the dividend is, but give shareholders the choice. of taking cash or new shares in the company. And so they still have a steady dividend policy in that, you know, 20% of our um, earnings uh, set aside for dividend, but then give shares the choice they can either take the cash or take shares in the company. And the beauty of that, uh, partly, it's better for shareholders, surely. You know, this idea of liquidity preference and so on. It's your choice. If you need the cash, take the cash. No problem. If, on the other hand, you don't need it, take new shares. You've got more shares, you're worth more. So shareholders have the choice. It's also good for the company because the, the less cash they have to pay out, the more they've got available to invest and expand. And so, given that it's quite likely that some shareholders will take shares, it means they're having to pay out less cash. It means there's more scope for expansion. So there's the two things. Have a steady policy so that shareholders aren't suddenly surprised. And perhaps consider having script dividends. Uh, well, I'm not going to repeat what I just said. Okay, anyway, just one more discussion there, chapter, and then we can get on to the numbers proper. <coughs> 